Hello everyone, again, thank you for joining us. I see a lot of familiar names here today. I'm here with my colleague from McNeil Europe, Bernard Lorente, and today's speaker, Diego Garcia. Thank Hello, you, Diego, everyone. for accepting our the invitation to present this webinar today. Diego is an expert in digital fabrication and co-founder of the Authorized Rhino Training Center Control Mat, where I knew him in the Master in Parametric Design a few years ago. He has a master in biodigital architecture by Universitat Internacional de Catalunya, and he currently teaches at, at Universitat Europea Architectural Geometry and Parametric Design. But he is he's here today to present his book, Advanced 3D Printing with Grasshopper. The book forms a connection between both the worlds of Grasshopper and 3D printing, explaining how to transform a design into a series of curves and paths for a 3D printer. So we will learn how to create a G-code directly within Grasshopper without any script or plugin. The book focuses mainly on clay 3D printing, but the same logic can be applied to thermofilament 3D printing. These methods open up a wide range of new possibilities when 3D printing, like non-planar printing or non-conventional paths for the 3D printer. Just two quick reminders. Uh, first is that you can ask your questions for Diego in the chat, and we will try to answer them in the last 15 minutes. And the second is that this webinar is being recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel in a few days. So if you don't want to miss it, I will copy the link to our channel in the chat and you can subscribe to receive the notification when it is uploaded and also find other webinars there. Okay, and that's all for, uh, from my side and I don't want to lose more time because I really want to see the presentation from Diego. So please share your screen and you can start when you want Diego. Well, hello Guillermo, hello all. Uh, thanks for the presentation and thanks for the invitation to You're join welcome. this webinar by by McNeil Europe. No, I'm. It's a really honor to be here, and I'm really flattered to see that uh, we have almost 150 people enrolled. Thanks to all to share one hour of your time with me. I hope it will be worthy. Um, Today's uh, presentation uh, is divided into three parts. At the very beginning, I'm going to introduce myself, show some projects that are related with my background. Then I'm going to um, move to Grasshopper. To, we're going to talk a little about 3D printing. And finally, we're going to try to do our first basic G-code in Grasshopper directly for 3D printing. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with the technology, I guess so, that probably most of you have 3D printed before, or probably you have your own 3D printers at home, or you work uh, at the office with them, and so on, or digital fabrication stuff in general. So probably this could be very interesting or useful for most of you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. There we, there we go. So um, I mostly use my Instagram profile as a um, background, I mean, a, a place, a framework, let's say, or a canvas where to uh, show uh, the students' uh, projects, basically, or the projects that we do at the office. So um, I'm not going to open it now. We can check it out later if you want. Uh, I can show some videos and so on. But if you're interested on following some of the stuff that we are developing right now, I think Instagram is uh, the most useful tool nowadays because, I mean, if someone, I have, uh, when I was studying architecture, no, I'm an architect, as we almost explained. When I was studying architecture, I mean, the, the best projects were found in the specialized magazines and the newspapers and so on. Uh, but now, no, now, I mean, the social media, uh, for example, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on, are super fast and for me, they are the most inspirational place to find what people is doing around with these cutting edge technologies. So for me, this is a very useful tool in order to follow all of you and if you want to follow me or whatever. So keep it in mind because uh, it's uh, super interesting. In there, uh, I manage different profiles. Uh, mine, that is Professor Cuevas. And then Control Mat. Control Mat is my company, the company that I have with my partner, Sergio. And there we uh, do a lot of training and a lot of projects, always related with parametric design and digital fabrication tools. 
I will tell you something about that later. Then also I teach at a uh, university, uh, university here in Madrid, Universidad Europea, like European University, something like that. And this is the profile of the, or the account of the, of the of architecture and at the master course, the master course in architecture, that is a master that you need to do if you want to uh, sign projects as an architect. No? Let, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our working control map because it's very important to understand what we're going to do later. In Control Matter, is an Authorities Rhino training center and Authorities Rhino um, Fab Studio. Uh, we have three parts training, projects, and fabrication. And that's the part that we're going to focus later. In the training part, we teach a lot of students worldwide uh, different techniques of uh, digital fabrication based always in, on uh, Rhino or parametric design with Grasshopper. For example, now we are currently in, uh, doing our most interesting, let's say, uh, workshop that is a master in parametric design that is a hybrid edition since this COVID thing is around us. Before it was all on site, now it's half or part online, part on site with awesome teachers as, for example, us, uh, of course, <laughs> no, but uh, awesome ones as, for example, Arturo Tedeschi, maybe you have heard about uh, his book, AAT, or uh, the developers of uh, Caramba, you know, the plugin for uh, structural analysis, and or Andres Gonzalez from uh, McNeil, Miami, and some others. And so it's super, it's like the best course that we have created in order to try to learn all the possible stuff about this parametric design that is never enough. That's it, that's the truth. And so these are pictures of the students doing different stuff with uh, digital fabrication tools, with a laser cutter, with a milling machine, with the three printers and so on. But also uh, as we have the know-how, and this is very interesting, for example, if you're thinking on, I mean, imagine that you're in the situation that you know how to do grasshopper, you can handle these tools, you're an expert on it, and you want to, to start working. Uh, there is a lot of work on uh, parametric consultancy for different companies. Traditional companies start to implement parametric design in their processes. And so we have used a lot of companies in basically in, in Spain, where we are, we are in Madrid, uh, to implement this type of techniques in, in their workflows. For example, we have used people, uh, uh, companies to, to implement it in chair design in a very important company in Valencia or for uh, furniture design or for uh, violins, for helmets, uh, another company of helmet design. This was a construction company. It was a structure for a roof or a, of a mall. Or this was a company that uh, makes infrastructures, basically tunnels for high-speed trains. And, uh, and, and, and they have been always working with CAD tools, mainly AutoCAD or CATIA sometimes. And now they have to do collaborations with uh, companies in Europe or in other countries. And those companies maybe handle parametric tools and they have to up to date. And there is where they found us and we help them to implement the tools into their normal processes. So this is a very interesting part of our, of our work. As we have the tools, we have a large size uh, of a mini machine and some others and the three printers and so on. We also provide data fabrication services. It's very interesting too, because you can do models, you can do mockups, um, uh, you can help sculptors, artists worldwide, not only in Spain, we, we collaborate a lot with artists that they don't know how to develop their projects. No? And they come to us and maybe we do the digital part or we, we do the digital and the physical part with digital fabrication, depends. Or we develop a lot of models because these models done by hand, it's almost impossible. I mean, I mean the level of accuracy uh, with digital fabrication tools is much more obviously than just by hand. So. When you're working with models, basically you use the laser cutter, but milling machines, three printers are also very interesting. Sculptures. And as we are architects, we also want to develop ourselves in this in, in our field. 
So there is where uh, we can, when we do, where we do uh, interior design, furniture design, uh, roofs, rooftops, uh, bars, collaborations on product design. There's a collaboration with uh, Arturo Tedeschi and Biese. Biese is one of the biggest companies for uh, million machines, uh, five axis in, in, the, in the world is from Italy. And for different clients, private clients, uh, companies. And the good thing of parametric design sometimes is that you can reuse your uh, definitions, no, your grammars, just changing the inputs. And so, for example, the same grammar could be like this one, could be applied to do design a pattern on a piece of furniture, or it, as in the bottom, you can see, or it can be applied to a larger scale for a competition in architecture. No? because the algorithm does not change that much. Furniture, a lot of uh, furniture design also for exterior, for rooftops. We have worked for IKEA. IKEA, you know, there are, there are two companies, the IKEA where you buy the furniture and the big IKEA, the IKEA group that they have malls. Uh, this was developed for the one of the malls. You know? to place these two pieces of, uh, of furniture in, the, in one of the malls in Valladolid, a city here in Madrid, in, in Spain, sorry. Uh, refurbishment, this was uh, a restaurant we did a long time ago. We're very proud of it. It was a lot of milling and so on. No? So this is my background. This is what I do for a living in general, working every day with parametric design and working with digital fabrication tools for different clients. So. I understood the way the machines work, no? the CNC technology, the computer numerical control technology. That's fine. Then uh, at the university where I teach uh, at the master course, uh, every year we have we do a workshop at, in, in London or close to London. Uh, it's a collaboration with uh, Barlet School of Architecture where we go to a place called the farm and there uh, they have robots, robot arms, and the students play around with uh, clay extrusion. You know? So we're, this is like a 3 printing technology, uh, but instead of using like a desktop 3 printer, we use uh, robot arms. And the things here change a lot because you don't use a software that creates the object that you want to do. You have to use a software to create the path that you want the robot arm to follow. Okay, so you're entering a lot into the detail of what you want to do with that robot arm. And there the students explore the possibilities of the material, explore the possibilities of the tools, no? because when you have a robot arm, you can go uh, till six, seven axes with it, depends. And they are doing their own projects for the master course, but exploring at the same time possibilities for models, mockups, pictures, uh, in general, digital fabrication that could uh, complement their projects. No? So this picture on the right is uh, very similar to what was the project of this student in the end. No? So there on the left, you can see, for example, the path that you have to design for the robot arm, and on the right, the result of the clay mixed with sand. This was an experiment on, on that exactly. No? But not many people have a robot arm with a struder. That's obvious, no? But tons of people have a desktop FDM 3D printer. An FDM 3D printer is the typical 3D printer of filament for PLA, ABS, and so on. It's fuse deposition modeling. Those are the capitals, no? what they stand for. So applying one of my personal models in life, Oh, no, sorry, this is not. If you can dream it, you can achieve it. No, that's not, that's not true. Sorry, I don't know why, why this is here. Ah, yes, this one, yes. This, you can do almost anything with Grasshopper. That's my motto. And I try to use Grasshopper almost for everything. Once someone told me, no, no, you cannot use Grasshopper for everything. I said, come on, I'm going to show you that I can use Grasshopper to win the lottery. And he was laughing. And no, no, I, I found a way to win the lottery using the software. It's true, sorry, that I didn't want that much. I, it was like a couple of euros, but the system worked. I have not used it anymore, but it, there is a video in YouTube if you want to explore it and, you've, and you search for something like uh, winning the lottery with Grasshopper, you will see me explaining some interesting tools on Grasshopper 
to uh, do some logics with numbers. Uh, and so there you can you can try to win the lottery. If you win it, please tell me, because I, I couldn't that much, no? And so as you can do almost everything in Grasshopper, and I have this background of CNC technology, and I saw, and we were exploring this complex models with Rotarm, I found that this was very useful for people. So I contacted uh, Gianluca, Gianluca Pugliese from Low Poly. There on the left is Gianluca, there on the right is Low Poly, Low Poly is his company. And uh, we decided, ah, that is Gianluca, <laughs> we decided to uh, create a book where we're gonna explain how to 3D print using Grasshopper with no other software, no plugins, nothing, just native Grasshopper. And it's extremely simple once you understand how it works, but at the same time could be very complex because when you want to achieve complex results, uh, obviously it could be very complex, but now we are using it almost every day and many people around the world is using also uh, the same techniques. This is the book that you can have a look at the interiors and pages and some models that we did uh, inside of the development no, of the explanation of the, of the different models. So the idea is that you have a model in Rhino or in Grasshopper, and then you design the paths for the machine directly. So you're not doing a close object and exporting it as an ST file, a STL file. You're just designing the paths that you want for your machine. So you can apply attractors, you can apply pictures, you can apply vectors, any kind of uh, mathematical uh, approach to your design that in the end, what you're doing is <clears throat> designing the path for the, for the machine. So as I told you, we can do almost everything with Grasshopper. I'm gonna follow this explanation directly in uh, Grasshopper. Let's move to Grasshopper. There we are. First, we're gonna talk a little about the different technologies we can find in the market for 3D printing. No? Basically, there are two types of technologies, the extrusion one and the sintering one, the binding one. The extrusion called FDM, Fuse Deposition Modeling, is a technique where the, you have a machine that has a material that goes into a nozzle and it's pushed out the nozzle, usually with a smaller diameter. It's just that, okay? It could be, as you can see here, plastic, it could be ABS, it could be PLA, nylon, PTEG. PTEG is like the most common one for uh, pellet uh, material because the material could, the material could be in filament, uh, like in the structure of a filament, or it could be like a small balls, it's called pellet. And that's maybe the most common one, but you need a special extruder, no? usually a larger extruder, that's the one used with, um, with robot arms. So if you're, if you're gonna use plastic, probably you will have to preheat the bill plate or you will have to preheat the materials to usually uh, from 190 to 225, or if they are high, high impact materials or plastics, maybe even up to 350 depends, okay? That depends, so as you saw on the plastic or so. But as this technology is something that is basically extruded, you can extrude anything. You can extrude clay. In that case, you need no temperature at all. You don't need to preheat the bill plate or the extruder, the nozzle, nothing at all. Or you could, uh, for example, extrude concrete or chocolate or pizza or anything, okay? If you're curious about the pizza thing, it's as simple as typing in YouTube, um, Pixa 3D printer. It has obviously three extruders, one for the base, another for the um, cheese, and another for the tomato. Obviously, probably an Italian will die uh, if they see this video, but in the end, it's a 3D printed pizza. That's what it is. And the other technology 
or technique for 3D printing is the sintering or binding one, where you have a build plate that is full of material. So there is no a proper build plate where you construct your object, your object is the material. And so there is a binding technology that hardens that part of the material. Okay. There you will find the pounder ones, the ones that are look like a plaster, no? Basically, Setcorp or Setcorp was the first company working with this, and the binder, the the the, the thing that hardens the material, the pounder is kind of a water, or it, they could be the metal ones from Stratasys mainly, and they use a laser, a laser to harden the material, to bind that material, to bind that metal ball, those metal balls, or resin. And resin then, we could be talking about a laser UV light or a screen light, like a LED light, okay? And those uh, have their own names, SLS, SLM, SLA, BLS. Those are the most common ones. But from time to time, new technologies appear, new models appear. So it's really hard to be up to date in this 3D printing uh, world, let's say. So as this is kind of more complex technology, we need to handle a lot of movements and it's not that easy. The book focuses on the extrusion uh, uh, printers, okay? There, we can find two types of printers, depending on the coordinate system that they use. They could be Delta, you know, they use a polar system of coordinates. The typical one is the WASP, is the one that we use. This, this is why I have these pictures here because those are models that we have here in the in the company. But as you know, it's plenty of uh, of machines, machine types, and, and brands, and so on. Or Cartesian. Delta means that the definition of the movements depends on some angles, and Cartesian means that the definition of the movements or the coordinates depend on x, y, and z coordinates from I0, zero, zero, okay? But we could use any of those types for our designs because uh, we don't need to care about that. The firmware, that is the software that is installed inside the machine, is the one that is gonna translate our model into polar coordinates or Cartesian coordinates. So as we're not gonna modify the firmware because that's the software that makes the machine work, makes the machine be alive, um, we don't need to care if this is uh, Delta or if it is Cartesian. The only thing that could change is that, for example, in a polar one, in a Delta one, we have a base that is circular. And so the center, the zero, zero will be there. While in our Cartesian one, could be that our zero is in one corner or that the zero could be in the center. We'll have to double check, no? And this is important because when we will do our model in Rhino, in the grasshopper, this is my x-axis, my y-axis, we'll have to place the model in the exact point depending on the printer that we're using. So for example, if I'm using a Delta one, that has this build plate, I will have to place my model in here. But if I'm using a Cartesian where the zero is the corner, and so this is the build plate of this machine, I will have to place my object in here. So that's important according to the machine. Okay, that's something that we should know, but we can test it doing our first G-code and checking what's going on, okay? Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the standard 3D printing workflow. If you have some experience 3D printing, this is, the, you have done this probably many times already. It means that you make your model in Grasshopper, no? Then you have to bake it into Rhino. Depending on the model that you did, you could have a B-Rep, you know, a V-rep or a rep, it's uh, any kind of uh, surface or polysurface, a nerves, okay? Or you could have a mesh. If it is a mesh, you directly export it as an STL file. If it is a rep, so a nerves, you will have to transform it into a mesh and then export it as STL file. 
you could skip this process because every time that you export as an STL file in Rhino, the STL only can handle meshes. So this is automatically gonna transform your nerves into a mesh, okay? So you need to control the mesh in between if you don't want to. But I would recommend to do it like this, to transform the nerves into mesh and then the mesh as a steel that is not going to change. But anyway, that depends on how you want to do it. Uh, in that model in, you're doing in Rhino, it is very important that your model is closed. No, that is also called the watertight that it's uh, no non-manifold. Non-manifold uh, means that uh, we can manufacture it. And if we can manufacture it, it means that there are no duplicated edges, duplicated faces, this kind of stuff, okay? And usually uh, it's very, if we do it with a good base, a good contact with a build plate. Also, we don't need too many, too much supports and so on. And, Finally, our model has to be in real size, one is to one scale, in millimeters or in inches, depending on if we are in metric system or imperial system. Okay, so there we have our model, export it as STL, and then once, once you have the STL, you go into the slicer software. That, that is a type of a software that creates the famous G code. That is the code that you're gonna introduce in the machine and the machine is gonna move. That software, well, could be the software of the machine. If you if it is a machine that uh, costs a lot, probably it has its own software developed for 3D printing. If it is a do-it-yourself 3D printer, probably you will have to use one of these uh, software, not like Slicer, Simplify 3D, Cura, or Repetier. Those are the most famous ones. Once you have your model into this software, you will have to handle different parameters like the layer height or the infill type or percentage, et cetera, the build plate contact type, you know, if you want to have a raft or things like that, if you want supports or not, or in which parts do you want supports, the temperatures depending on the material, et cetera. So once you set all these parameters in your slicer software, the software outputs something called the cheat code. That cheat code, has three parts on it. It usually has a start protocol. That means get ready. No, it tells to the machine, hey, there we go. Get ready because we're gonna have three prints. And there you will have several instructions inside that G code that prepare the machine. Some of the most typical ones, for example, M82, set the extruder to absolute coordinates or G28, all axes have to go home, or G92 to write the extruder, for example, to zero because the extruder was in uh, whatever position, right? So, but the same as we have these three, if it is a plastic machine that it has to preheat the plastic, et cetera, et cetera, you will have a set of many instructions to prepare that machine for 3D printing. Once the machine is ready, there will be a core of that G code that defines our model. Basically that core with instructions are instructions called G1 because G1 is the order in G code to describe a controlled movement, it means move. Move where? Well, to some coordinates. For example, to this coordinate in X, to this coordinate in Y, this coordinate in X, this coordinate in Y, and also the same you're moving, please extrude some material and do it at this speed. Okay, this is what it means. So the instruction, the complete instruction means move at this speed to this coordinate and also extrude that much. Extrude because we have another stepper motor, no? That moves the plastic or the clay or the concrete or whatever that uh, has to uh, push the material outside. So this is what this E means. Um, so we'll have not just one line, we'll have hundreds, millions, billions of lines, of lines of instruction like this that describe our movement. 
And each line describes a point, a single point. So if I want to do a movement like this with a 3D printer, this will be discretized or divided into points with their own X, Y, Z coordinates. Okay. And the machine will move from here to the next point and to the next point and to the next point and to the next point. And each point will represent one of these lines of the G code. Okay. Here we have only two, this and this, but we could have millions, okay, depending on the complexity of our model. And once we have finished 3 printing our model, there is usually an end protocol for that tells the machine what to do once you finish. No, because, okay, you finished printing, but what do we do now? Well, T28 means go uh, home with all the axes, no? go down the build plate, go back to zero, blah, blah, blah. So the machine moves everywhere or uh, turn off the fan, turn off the heater, uh, turn off the temperature, turn off, turn off whatever, no? or do beep. All these instructions can be described in here. So that's the magic, basically. So if we go into Grasshopper and we want to create our own G code, we have to do it manually. Means that we'll have our model in Grasshopper. That model could be a VREP, it could be a mesh, it could be anything. But at the end, what we need are X, Y, Z coordinates. So our, our design could be a VREP, and then we'll have to transform it into curves and those curves into polylines and those polylines into points and those points into coordinates. Or it could be a mesh and then from mesh, it will go directly into polyline no, because it makes no sense that, I mean, we cannot create curves if we have a mesh and from polylines to points and from points into coordinates. Or we could have a design that is just made of polylines. Oh, you can draw the polylines that you want the machine to follow. And so you have the polylines, transform them into points and those points in X, Y, Z coordinates. Okay? So there are different paths that you have to follow, but you will have to finish always thinking on the X, Y, Z coordinates of the points to move the extruder to. I don't know if that's clear. So for example, in this model, I will have to uh, get the coordinates of this point, then this other point, then this other point, and then this other point. And the extruder, the machine will move like this. Da, da, da. And then if I come back to this point, I will have to provide again the coordinates of this point. And if I want to move up, I will have to provide the coordinates of this other point. And it will move here, and then here, and here, and here, etc. Da, 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 da. Okay, that's it. So, okay, imagine that you can figure out a way to have those coordinates. How can you create a G code with my favorite tool in Grasshopper ever? probably one of the most simple ones, concatenate. Maybe you have not used this tool never before. It is in the set text menu. There you have it. There is a way to find the tools. If you press Control Alt in the keyboard and click on the tool that you want, there you see it goes to the set menu, text. Okay. And so this awesome tool allows you to put text together. So if you have the X, Y, Z coordinates as numbers, you can create a code, something like this, no? Because you will have this number for X, this number for Y, this number for Z, and you need to add the Z, the Y, the X, the, the speed, the order, the instruction in, for the G code, etc. We're gonna do it, okay? What happened to those parameters we were talking about, layer height, infill, the contact with the build plate, the supports, the temperatures, et cetera? We don't have a software that does all that work for us. So we have to do it our own. 
ourselves in Grasshopper. So the layer height will depend on the drawing or the contour or the isocurs that we design. So if we have a model like this and we do contours, contour are sections of our model, the distance between the sections will be the layer height. If we're working uh, on something more complex, like non-planar 3D printing, because we can do non-planar 3D printing, because it's just following a line, uh, there you can um, design the isocurves and the distance between the isocurves will be the layer height, but the layer height will be variable then. No? So we cannot talk about a layer height in that case. If you want infill, you will have to design it. it. Means that you have to design the path of the machine to create that infill. There is no magic tool that creates an infill. The build plate contact has to be designed to, if you want to do a rough or a rim, you know, like an offset to hold it better, you have to design that offset. If you want, you want to do a base of, on your model, you will have to design the path for that base. You have to design everything. Uh, if you want troubles, means that, uh, that you are, for example, printing something in here, and then you want to move outside and do something in here, that maybe connects with this other in the future, you have to design this travel without extrusion. You have to do everything. There is no help. But on the other hand, you have completely freedom. Supports, you can design them obviously, but the designing supports becomes a little tough. It's more complex. So better if you can through point without supports. And the temperatures, you don't need to care about temperatures because you will, you're gonna copy them from the start G code of your machine. So let's do this a small example. If you have your computer, obviously you have it with yourself with, uh, with Rhino installed, you could use Rhino 6 or Rhino 7. You can follow this definition and understand what we're going to do. And that way you can have an idea of how to create your own G code. So we're gonna start with a cylinder. Okay, you can find cylinder. Remember that there is the option to double click on the canvas or just space bar and type cylinder. The, the cylinder. There it goes. Oh, let me disable the snapping gecko. This thing that you see that it creates like a lot of auxiliary lines and so on. It's a nice plugin called snapping gecko I use for the tutorials to have everything aligned and so on but I'm gonna disable it because um, it could be a, a little annoying. So we're gonna do a cylinder with a radius 25 and length 50. Those are millimeters, okay? Well, remember every time that you design something for digital fabrication, 3 printing, laser cutting, milling machine, robot arms, etc., it has to be in millimeters or inches if you're in an imperial system, okay? So, um, 25 and 50 to get those numbers, just double click, type the numbers 25, and then you will get a number slider. Or if you don't want a number slider, you want a panel like me, you can use, for example, double slash and 25. Or type panel and 25, okay? 25 and 50. And this should create, let's have a look at Rhino, there we are. Layers. This is going to create an empty or void cylinder like this. It's a simple surface. Obviously, we're not going to do something complex. We have to keep it super extremely simple. Oh. Hello. John, John. The next tool we're going to use is contour. Maybe you're not familiar with the icons. And you use Grasshopper with uh, texts. I have the solution here. There is another nice plugin, a very simple one. It is called Bifocals. This Bifocals is very helpful for uh, tutorials and so on because you can see both the icon and a label with the name of the tool. So, what we're going to do is uh, contours. Contours are sections of our model in the set direction and the distance between contours is gonna represent our layer height, okay? So you can type any number. Probably if you have a desktop 3D printer, you're usually 
working with a layer height of 0 0.15, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, no? something like that. Well, I typed one millimeter to see it like super clear here, but that's it. Okay. There you have. Let me turn off the grid. Right now, yeah. With function xf7, function f7, if you have a keyboard that it has only the tool f7 apart, it's just f7. Otherwise, function f7, you can turn on and turn off that grid. That could be very annoying sometimes. <clears throat> so there we have the sections that are going to be the paths for the 3D printer directly. So this is what the slicer software does, sectioning the model, and that's it. But these are curves, I told you. We have to transform our curves in polylines or points or something like that. We have a B-rep. Oh, we, we were here with a cylinder. This was the cylinder. We transform that into curves with contour. And now we're going to directly get points. To get those points, we're going to use the byte curve in 50 parts, for example. So every single curve is going to be divided into 50 parts or in 50 points. Right? Those points are going to represent the points where the extruder have to move to. Of course, this has no a lot of resolution because when I have 50, from this point to this point, I will have a straight line. So maybe if I 3D print this, I could see like the faces on the cylinder, not like when we have a low resolution model, it would be better to have more points. So if 50 is not, not enough, we can we could add more like 200. In that case, as you can see here, we'll have a lot of points. Our G code will be bigger, it's fine but it will be much nicer, the cylinders to print it. I'm gonna add just 50 to keep it simple, but for you to know what we're doing, okay? So curves, points, and finally, we're gonna flatten this uh, information. The information here, it's in a data tree where we have 50 lists. And each list contains 50 points. So we have one list per curve. And each list contains the 50 division points of every curve. No? If we add a panel, you will see the coordinates of the points. And sometimes this changes to, as you can see here, another list. So we have a data tree. There is another useful tool, the param viewer that does like a summary of the information that we have here. So 50 branches, the same as 50 lists. So we have a tree of 50 lists with 50 elements each list. No? With double click, you can see a diagram that describes that, that data tree. I don't know if you're familiar with this kind of things or not that much, but the important thing is that if we flatten the, all these lists, we will create just one single list with all the points together. No? It's like a way to simplify the information. And now, as we have a list with all the points, so it was 2,500 or something like that. If we draw a polyline using these points, no, and redrawing the polyline using these points, there will be a connection here. Because after the first list that starts in this point and finishes in this point, goes the next list that is this one. So this describes, this polyline describes perfectly the movement that the three printer is going to follow means that it's going to start in this point, then move to this one, this other, this other, this other, etc. And when it finishes with the first curve, it will move to this point. So there it will, we will get like a continuous movement. And this will be the seam of the model, no? where the model connects. Obviously, this can be improved. Now it's like a ramp. What we have is with this slope, no? but the slope could be all along all the points and it could be super soft. It's what it's called a spiralized 
No, we could develop that spiralized that can be done into, and so we'll create one single curve, one single path, but spiralized like a spring. That would make our model more efficient visually without that seam. But that is more complex. We're gonna keep it like that. So this polyline outputs the path of the movement, uh, but what we need is to create a G code. Well, if we take the points and deconstruct the coordinates of those points, this is a very useful tool, no? deconstruct. They would deconstruct us, it takes the coordinates as I said, and puts them separately in three outputs. So uh, for example, in here, in this one, I will have all the X coordinates of the points. So this represents the X coordinates, the next one, the Ys, the next, the sets. And then we go to our favorite tool that is concatenate. So concatenate puts everything together. Means that we're gonna add the speed. Then we're gonna add, well, this should be better like this. Yeah, we're gonna do it like this. We're gonna tell the instruction to move. That is G1. In G code, G code, the G code is an alphanumeric code, no, filled with instructions that the machines understand that uses all the letters from of the alphabet from A to Z. But G is the one that describes a movement. So when you're trying to do something, digital fabrication, you have to move the machine. So there is always G, G1, 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 G1. That's why it is called G code. It's not called um, M code because the G is a predominant tool on it. No? So G1 means move at the speed uh, to this coordinate in X, and then we add all the coordinates in X to this coordinate in Y, and then we add all the coordinates in Y to this coordinate in Z, all the coordinates in Z, and then extrude, for example, one millimeter for each point. Tac, 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 tac. Okay. If you have concatenate and you know how to do this, it's as simple as zooming in. And when you zoom in on the tool, this option appears to add more inputs. So you have to add more inputs and you can concatenate more stuff. Okay. So once we have concatenated all these things, what we get is this uh, instructions. It's move at this speed to this coordinate in X, Y, and Z, and extrude one millimeter of material, plastic, clay, pizza, whatever. Then move to the same speed to this other coordinate and extrude one millimeter. Move to this, etc. cetera. And move and move and move and move and move, move and extrude, move and extrude, move and extrude. So there we have our 2,500, remember the zero also, uh, instructions for all the points that we have in our cylinder. It's, we are very close to the end because now what we have to do with this G code is to tell the machine that has to get ready to do this. To do that, we do another panel and we copy Control C, Control V in this panel, the instructions of our machine. If you don't know what are the instructions of your machine, it's as simple as going to one G code that you did previously with Cura or any other software. No, you open the G code and you will see a start, a start uh, uh, G code or G code start to do, 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 do a lot of instructions, copy them, paste them here. Then the code, that is what we have created. And then the end protocol that is not gonna be only one, obviously it's gonna be a lot. So you go again to your G code, open it, one that is already done, select all that stuff and paste it. For example, if you're working with Cura, Cura has an option to, edit or to copy the um, end and the start G code of the machine that you're using. But if you're not using Cura, you can do it with an already uh, existent G code that you have used previously. Put them into panels and with merge, put all together. So first the start protocol, then the, the G code that you have developed, and then the end protocol, the end G code. And there you have your custom G code, as simple as this. This is gonna be understood by your printer if you have copied 
the start and the end protocols of your printer. So what we should do is right click on it, copy data only, not all content because all content means that we should, that we would copy also the indexes or the, the number of the list or the tree, et cetera. No? So we don't need that information. So just copy data only. And then we go to the most complex software ever. Let me open it. That is, well, it's, I have many things because I had two screens before, but it was not working, sorry. So I have to search for it here. Yeah, my notepad. Maybe you have never used it before, but if you start 3D printing like this, you will use it a lot. So my notepad, that is say it's block the notas in Spanish, just control V. And then you need to file, save as, uh, whatever, um, I don't know where. And important, don't save it as TXT because that is the default extension for the notepad. Save it as whatever, hello, dot, G code, as simple as that. Once you save it like this, you can copy it and send it to your three printer that is going to do it. If you're using Mac, you have the text edit tool, but you, and you have to do something very, very similar to the notepad in Windows okay. and save. That's it. And there you have your G code for three printing. That will allow us to uh, do or, or control any kind of path for the 3D printer. I know, for example, this kind of things. This is with uh, clay. You see, this is a non planar printing, and it's not easy to do with a, with a normal printer. Okay. But in Grasshopper, you design the path, the waves, with the, with the non planar curve that you want. And then the printer will follow those. Well, this is like uh, the whole process on clay because we were uh, glazing the pieces, etc. But there you see like a lot of examples of what I'm explaining. I made this video for the students to understand how this works. You see that there is no planar curves. They all are changing the shape. Well, this was whatever, no? It was like, okay, I need to do something not planar. I, uh, I, I took the idea from a uh, female body and that's it. Or we could do wireframe 3D printing. And there is no solid object, obviously, here. Here you have only the path, the curves. There you have the curves in Grasshopper and those curves into points and points into G code and the machine does what you want the machine to do. Not, you're not limited by the possibilities of the slicer software. That's what I mean. We like clay a lot. We use clay because clay is a very interesting material. There you see another example. It's just a loft, that loft has an algorithm, a grammar in Grasshopper that creates the curves, the waves, and those waves go directly into the, into the 3D printer. So that was all. I think it's been almost one hour. So we could have uh, some Spare minutes if you have any doubt or you have any question that you would like to ask. Yes, thank you, Diego. It's been awesome. I really like it. And yes, we have some questions already. Um, first, uh, Kitchen was asking about the material that you use, but as you have explained, I think you have used a lot of them and you have been trying with many materials, right? I don't yeah, know if uh, about the clay yeah. you can say something more if it's something specific or it's just experimenting with it and with the mm, the clay it's a little mysterious at the beginning until you work with it 
I mean, at the beginning, it's like, wow, that's the most complex thing that you can do, the clay. But in the end, it's uh, preparing normal clay, the clay that you will use for the lathe to work with it by hand and putting into the machine. The machine is ready for the process. And then it's just a normal extrusion of the material. It's much more simple than plastic because it's not necessary to preheat it. It's nothing. It's just a perfect extrusion. So it's even more simple than plastic. Yeah. And I have worked with uh, different types of plastics, PTD, PLA, ABS. All of them are kind of similar except for the temperatures or something like that. But according to G-code, there is no big deal. Okay. Material. Thank you. Uh, also, Niels Heymans is asking if uh, have you experimented with G2, G3, G-code commands to make use of arcs? You could. I, I have not. Uh, I mean, mm, I know what, what you're thinking uh, about because uh, in G-code, you can create your own G-code, like uh, move to this point and then do this arc you know, with this radius and then this other thing, and you can develop it like in an engineering way, let's say. But what uh, I'm explaining in the book is uh, how to get free of all those rules, let's say, and just make any kind of shape without arcs, without anything. I mean, when you do a freeform curve, it does not respond to a radius. It has a different radii for each point. So what I'm explaining this way is that we don't care about the radii, we don't care that much about the model, that you just divide it into points, more or less, and then it will go to those points. It's like even more simple. So it's it, this is funny because we called it advanced 3D printing, but it should be called like the most simple 3D printing ever. Yeah. But it's something that we don't know how to use because of the slicer so forth, no? but it's a good question. Yeah, I think that answer also answers this question about uh, from Alex Gabriel about how do you the, how do you do a closed bottom surface but I think it's just depending on how do you want you, to print it you have to you have to design answers. it yeah you yeah. have to design it so usually uh, if you have a base like this I mean this corresponds uh, let me bring something with base This one. So, for example, this is a loft. It's just the loft, right? It's non planar. Nice. But you want to do the base too, right? This base was done through printing. And you can almost see the path of an offset to the interior. So, you have to design it. When you, once you have this curve, because this is the curve for the beginning of the loft, you have to use the same curve to do offsets until the center. So you will have to start in the center printing, following those offsets. And then once you arrive here, going up and creating the rest of the model. Yeah, you have to design everything. The list and that's all. Mm. Uh, yeah, and also, for example, Javier Vallejo is asking, um, well, saying cool webinar. And how can you create infield trajectories? I don't know if you have tested that or if you are only doing you, you can, surface. You can. You can, no, no, you can create infill trajectories. And for example, you would be doing like a big pieces of plastic. The plastic is not, is not that rigid, yeah. you know? So you will need to connect those with uh, an infill. You have to design the infill too. So it it's takes, not automatic. It's not, it's not automatic. No, no, no. It's not automatic at all. The only automatic thing uh, would be getting the points from the path, but the path you have to, it has to be designed. And sometimes it's not that easy. But think that sometimes you, it's impossible to develop what you need with a slicer software with a Cura or something like that, because it gives you only a few patterns of infill. And sometimes you would like maybe to do an infill where you have a lot of infill in one part, then no infill at all, then a little infill, or that infill could uh, respond to a structural analysis. And so you have to design it. Yeah, that also remembers me a question that was asked at the beginning um, about, from Kishan that asked, can we, well, it's a bit complex to read, 
but if it's possible to 3D print uh, buildings with clay, I think it's not with clay, it's with uh, earth probably. And how can we test structure structure stability? And I think it's just well that you can change the infill and you can change the the size of the walls, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are uh, some companies that are starting to do that thing. For example, Wasp, you know, mm -hmm. the, one of the examples of the three printer that I uh, show you in the picture, they are three printing houses with uh, soil, with earth. The idea of the company is that you go to the um, build site, take the soil from the site and use it to make the building. So to do that, a structural analysis on that is kind of complex because you need to know what is the resistance of the material that is earth, depending on the type of earth will be one or, an, or another. And then you have to design the infill for that to be stable. Maybe you have to make tests, contact with uh, very expensive engineers. I don't know. Okay, yes. Uh, also, Jiran Su is asking what is the best the biggest obstacle for the application of printing in your research experience? Is it material property or the toolpath programming or something else? Mm. Or everything together? <laughs> I would say everything mm. together. I didn't want yeah. to say that because it sounds like the easy, easy answer, but it's everything together. No, sometimes the, the material is painful because, for example, with clay, you know, with plastic is I mean, the plastic is more standard. You buy yeah. the plastic and it works. If it is not uh, out of date and it has the correct humidity and so on, it works and that's it. But with clay, that you have to prepare the clay yourself, you need to know the perfect amount of water. And maybe that amount of water works for one type of clay, but not for another. Uh, you cannot have bubbles of air inside of the clay because a bubble can destroy one uh, an element or um, I mean so many things can happen with the material and once you have the material under control that, that takes some time because you have to do a lot of experiments then the challenge comes with the path no uh, with the coding part but it's like two different separate worlds that uh, you need to handle. And that's very interesting because from my point of view, um, complete designer nowadays has to be a person that controls all the different stages of the design. It's, it cannot be just someone that has the idea no? and doesn't know how to make a 3D because maybe that idea cannot be developed in 3D. So you have to control how to make the 3D. And then you need to know what are the tools in, that in the industry that you can use, because maybe everything that you model cannot be transformed into an object. So you need to control the processes and you need to control the materials. And you need, so nowadays, I think a complete designer needs to know about all those eight stages uh, in order to, to understand how to uh, create a, a final object. So yep. it's not just that you know about clay or about plastics no you, or, or you or you know only about 3d and you have no idea about digital fabrication because then you will fail because it cannot be prototyped so it's complex okay i will try to read a few more questions but we are running out of time oh, yeah, so probably we need to to put the questions in youtube later or you can ask it to diego directly or to me but a few more. Uh, how would you implement a variable set slicing? I don't know if uh, you understand. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that, that can be done easily. Instead of uh, doing contours or sections of the model, following the isocurves of the model. You know, the mm -hmm. isocurves follow the same parameters on a nerve, on a surface. So if you modify the parameters of a surface that could be as simple as, for example, in this example, the sample of the cover, so you can understand how this works, or the easiest example ever, this one. Uh, there, there, uh, there yeah, I see. we see. <laughs> so if you have to uh, curves the base and the upper curve, and you create a loft in between, that loft has more space on this part than in the middle, right? So when you create that loft and get the eye shot curves 
of that surface, those isocurs will be something like this. And so yeah. those are the paths for your printer and this is directly non-planar. So it's just avoiding the tool contour and trying to use this other tool, for example, isocurs. No? Yeah, I think it's clear. Well, well, as you see, all the information is on the book. No, no, not no. all, not all. No, 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 no. no, no. It, ha it, it happens many to... times that uh, many people write me in, in Instagram, hey, I want to do this thing, blah, 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 and it's not explaining the book. How can I do this? I say, poof, without of work. I mean, the book yeah. explains like the most basic examples possible, no? Uh, but then it's true that when you want to develop something more complex, you need to work and research by, by your own a lot. Yeah, it's the same that learning grass software for, for yes. anything. Yes. You have to experiment. That's it. That's it. Okay, I'm going to read the last one because it's really late. Uh, for the machines like Ultimate Care, I guess the fabrication is always layer by layer. So the, this procedure will not uh, work or is just specific for a, spe a special class of machines? No, it's for or, every machine. Yes, it's a a machine that, that, yeah, it's a G code and it can be applied for any kind of 3D printer. The only thing that you need to know is what is the start G code and the end G code, no? those protocols of the machine that you can copy from an existing G code that you have. And then just uh, tell the machine where to go. I mean, it could describe something in the air, it could describe a text, it could describe any complex model. The machine will do uh, the path that you will describe in the grasshopper. It, you could, I mean, you don't need grasshopper even. You can type the code, you can make your G code typing, no? Coordinate by coordinate. This is done many times in, in factories. They have to type every single coordinate for the movement. You could do it and the machine will do it, any, any brand of machine. But if you can do it faster, no, with a grasshopper, that's much better. Well, then thank you, Diego. I think. That has been great. We have been more than 200 here today. More than that's 200. Oh my God, nice. I'm really flattered. And that's why a lot of questions have not been answered. I haven't been able to, to read all of them, but I will try to check them now and answer them in YouTube or send you an email. I'm not sure how to answer all of them, but I will try. Okay, try. So, yeah, <laughs> I, will, I will send them to you if I can answer. You have all my contacts so so you, you know how to find me Great. and um, some people was asking no to before the, the webinar if it was going to be recorded or something like yeah. that so it yeah, will be available fine. right i will share the link to youtube many times here in the chat but yeah it's going to be there i think next week because i can upload it today but uh if you follow the link to our youtube channel you can check it there and send a, a reminder to to find it when, when we upload it. And um, yeah, I think that's all. Thank you again. Awesome. No, well, thanks to you and thanks to thanks all to the people that spend one of one hour of their lives here listening to me. I think we learned a lot in this hour. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye bye.